Welcome everybody. Who are we? Now this is a little quiz. Who are we? We're the Collin County Republican Men's Club. George Ellis, you don't know. George Fletch, you don't know this, but how old are we? Oh, for heaven's sake. We're 52 years, years old. Hey, right. <laughs> what is our slogan? Jeff Lake, the bar? Jeff, you have it memorized? I do not. Sorry. The <laughs> bar. <laughs> What a disappointment. <laughs> Shoot him. Take him outside. <laughs> a couple of notes. Turn off your phone. And by the phone goes off, it's three dollars. What normally two, but now it's three. Because the Lord's upset me. He's a campaign. <laughs> Next. <laughs> Next, set a camera. We're on Facebook. So you ladies, watch the like it. I don't have any problem with your editing. Okay? All right, my friend. Yes, sir. Who are we? For the Collin County yeah, yeah, okay, Club, yeah. for men and women join together, learn together, yeah. and work together. And take your cheese to your way. Take your cheese to your way. I'm going to be in that narrow <laughs> comments for you. You're a high spin. <laughs> Old representative. Amen. Amen. So we're, he's, uh, he's okay. All right. Will you please uh, welcome us? Have a uh, Neil Katz, Neil, come on up here, my man. You got Everybody it. else did Neil a hand. Yeah, bravo. Can you leave us, sir, in the Pledge of Allegiance mm -hmm. to the U.S. flag? Yeah. Just want to say to everybody, thank you for your good wishes. Um, feeling great. Lost 30 pounds in the last two months. Feeling fine. <laughs> I don't know about good wishes, but we call them prayers. Well, that's it. Prayers, okay. I've been praying to the guy every night. All right. All right, please join me to pledge to our great country's flag. I pledge, pledge allegiance to, to, the to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Uh, Mike Vance, will you come forward and lead us in the uh, Texas flag uh, pledge, okay? Don't draw me the place to take the flag. On the Texas, Texas flag, flag, I pledge allegiance to thee, Texas, Texas, one state, under God, God one and indivisible. Please remain standing. Commissioner Darrell Hale, will you leave some invitation, please? Yes. Please bow your heads. Thank you, Lord, for allowing us to be here tonight in, in fellowship. And uh, please be with our, our speaker tonight as he imparts great knowledge and wisdom to us about some of the things that go on in the county for us. Um, also, I just want to thank you that we are able to live in a country that you know, has such a great constitution that ensures the rights and freedoms that we have. And you know, also be with our new judges that were appointed today, that they will have wisdom and you know be able to serve and, and provide great judgment. In his name I pray. Amen. 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 Please be seated. We have a full program this evening, a lot of material to uh, cover. And uh, we have a, a young gentleman in the county. I don't know if everybody knows. Do you know who the county agent is? Have you ever heard of that title? No? Huh? you ever hear of a county agent? He said if he didn't, I don't have to tell you the story. But I grew up. You know, we didn't know what the county commissioner was. We called them road commissioners. You know, and that was because when it rained, the damn roads washed out. And so if you didn't have a good relationship with your county, road commissioner, no stuff. Yeah, I said, okay, sir, what road said that? Well, the second most important man in the county was the county agent. Because if you had a problem with bow weavers or a fertilizer, who did you call them? Called the county agent. So we have the young man from the county agents going to tell us about the magic of that department. But the first speaker this evening is an announcement. I know I saw him walk in. But where is uh, Representative Leach? He's here, sir. He's in the bathroom. He'll get him. There's the sergeant of arms. <laughs> He's, uh, he can't be brought out from where he is right now. <laughs> 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 you know. I'm doing Hey Richard. Hey 
<laughs> First of all, sir, let me give you an introduction. How are you? Okay, very well, sir. Look at that. If you haven't, I know you've seen this, and we've been showing it for the whole year. But if you go to the uh, Texas uh, website, you can, follow, right, you can follow your representative. And you want to know their involvements and their activities, their committees. So this is a wonderful source. This is the most important man. Who, who uh, is in his district? Everybody know? Okay. So he's accountable to you. And he's, we're believe in a representative republic. And so his leadership, his guidance, and his voice is the most important thing for you and Connor Capital. With that little bit of introduction, sir, do you want to tell us what you learned in Austin this last, last time? <laughs> Talk about some things. Referendums. How, how many minutes do I have, or do you want me to speak? Yeah, am I just here as a filler, or am I? <laughs> no, you have eight and a half minutes. Eight, okay, wow. I so, 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 just to give you a little background. Richard, you want me to tie How are you? And, uh, and uh, to my predecessor and member of this club, Jerry Madden. Jerry, it's always great to see you as well. Uh, so let me tell you how I got got here tonight. Should I tell the story? Uh, so, so I had this on my calendar. Uh, we have a scheduling meeting with our team every Friday, and we were meeting last Friday, and we saw this on the calendar for this Thursday night that I'm supposed to be speaking tonight, and I texted Richard yesterday. I said, hey, just wanted to confirm I'm speaking tomorrow night. And he said, what? <laughs> <laughs> so, I didn't have you on the calendar. <laughs> yeah, you didn't. Uh, so I'm the fill-in tonight. I don't know who canceled, uh, but I'm here. I'm the backup plan. So, uh, yeah, so thank you. Judge, how are you? Doing well. Good to see you. Good to see all of you. So let me just briefly uh, uh, give you an update uh, from my perspective. And um, so, so great to be here tonight. I, I was planning on being here, and I'm glad I'm here. I'm glad it worked out. Um, we have a lot going on. Um, there's a lot that people are talking about. There's um, a lot that, that pe a lot of people are focused, looking back on the legislative session, some things that we did well, some victories that we were able to accomplish together some missed opportunities. I know that all of us would probably like to talk about. All of us are looking forward to the fall, to 2020, and the challenges that we're presented with, not only across the country and in the state of Texas, but here in Collin County. Uh, Richard and this group, of course, plays a key role in that. Um, what I want to focus on is um, where I see us right now here in Collin County. And I want to tell you some, some, can I give you some bad news and then some good news? Let me give you the bad news first. Uh, the bad news is that um, Better O'Rourke and all of the presidential candidates that are remaining, how many are there left? Hi, Jason. How are you? How many are there left? Twenty? <laughs> I mean, there's still 20. I've gone on the debate stage last week, there were like nine still left. The, the bad news is, is that Beto and Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders and Joe Biden are all talking about um, raising your taxes, raising taxes on the middle class, growing government, offering free everything, free college, ridding, doing away with all of the impending student debt in this country, um, growing government. Um, they're talking about supporting um, abortion up to 40 weeks, abortion on demand with no restrictions. Better O'Rourke is now unashamedly talking about not just gun control measures, but coming in and confiscating guns. Bring it on. From law-abiding, these are not criminals. These are law-abiding, responsible gun owners all across this country. Better O'Rourke is now talking about what all of us have known and suspected to be the case, that they want to confiscate guns from law-abiding citizens. And all of the other presidential candidates at best are being silent about it. In fact, uh, thank God for, uh, there's a couple Democrats, you see Joe Manchin from West Virginia, yeah. who came out yesterday and attacked Beto and said, um, with all due respect to Beto O'Rourke, he's not coming to take my guns. That's a Democrat senator from West Virginia. Can you imagine the people of West Virginia, much less Texas? <laughs> so that's the bad news. Here's the good news. Everything I just said. Everything I just said. That It's bad news because we are now, um, we, we realize just where the Democrats of today have gone. They, they are who they are, they are who we had suspected them to be, and now they are proudly proclaiming what they want to do. That's good news too. 
because that provides us, especially here in Collin County and in the state of Texas, clear lines in the sand, Richard, dividing lines, where when we go door to door, when we're up at forums, when you're um, working polling locations, when we're working to uh, protect this county, we have clear lines in the sand as to where the Democrats stand. I don't know who the Democrat candidate's going to be, but I know they're not just going to be your normal moderate Democrat. They're going to be a liberal progressive, because that's basically all that's left. If Joe Biden wants to win the Democrat primary, he's got to run far to the left, yeah. right? Um, President Trump is standing up for Israel. He's lowered taxes. He's cut regulations. He has um, not only appointed but worked to confirm over 150, 150 constitutional conservative judges to benches all across this country. Um, and uh, he's done exactly what he said he would do. He's kept his promises to this country. Lower taxes, cut regulations, um, done exactly what the Republican Party has been preaching for a long time. So if you ask me, I know a lot of folks, Republicans in Texas, are concerned about Texas turning purple and maybe blue. Is it a, a potential? Yeah. Could it possibly happen? Yeah. But I'm not worried about it. Because we have, we the ball is on the tee for us to hit it out of the park, or to hit it straight down the fairway, I should say. Um, we have such an opportunity here to protect, not only to protect, but to build upon what Dixie Clinton and Jerry Madden and Phyllis Cole and Richard Dobson and so many of you in this room, I could go, Fred Moses, have built here in this county. I'm so blessed to have been raised here in Collin County and in the state of Texas, and I have an obligation not just to you, Fred, and to you, Richard, and Dixie, not just to me, Kay, Phyllis, not just to you, and really not just to all of you in this room, but to my kids, Brady, Charlotte, and Landry, to, I'm, I'm not afraid to say it, fight like hell between now and next November to protect what we've built. And we have a great, great opportunity. Let me tell you, we, as we knock on doors, and as we talk to voters in our district, and if you look at Collin County, the five state legislative districts, HD 67, which I'm proud to represent, and HD 66, which Representative Sheehan represents, these are two of the top eight battleground districts in the state of Texas. We have it on good information that the Democrats nationwide are going to direct a million dollars into each of our races. Two, two to three million dollars will be directed by the Democrats into Collin County. Here's the good thing. I was with the governor this week in Austin. We're going to be fully funded by Republicans nationwide to fight in Collin County. I believe very strongly that this is going to be one of the strongest, most widely reported battlegrounds in the entire country. And so you have my pledge that we're going to go out and we're going to talk about the message of the Republican Party, opportunity, the rule of law, liberty, freedom, what we stand for, equality. Um, we're going to talk about what we've built here in Texas, and we're going to sell that to the people in HD 67, HD 66, and the people of Collin County. And I believe that we're not just going to protect what we've built, but we're going to actually grow our majority in the state of Texas. I actually believe, guys and ladies, we're the Republican men's club, so I'm going to say guys. There are Democrats in this county, people who think they're Democrats and may have voted Democrat that know they need to be voting Republican. And if I were to go tell Democrats across the street, that Better O'Rourke is going to come in and threaten to take your guns, they'll be like, where do I sign up to work for the Republican Party? I believe that very strongly. We're sensing that. We're getting that. Our polling shows us that. So I look forward to working with you, Richard, and your group in spreading that message. We have a challenge, but I'm up for the task. Are you? Are you? Uh, let, me, let me give you just things, and then I want to, if you, if, you're, if you have questions or comments, I want to take them. Uh, this November, uh, this past session, I was proud to author and pass legislation that officially will, uh, if the voters of Texas approve it, ban the possibility of a state income tax. Um, in the, in uh, the state of Texas, it will allow you this November, on, it's Prop 4. There's 10 propositions on a constitutional ballot. Prop 4, which I was proud to author and pass, will allow you once and for all to ban a possibility of a state income tax. You say, well, I thought it was already banned. I thought Bob Bullock banned it back in the 90s. Bob Bullock, to his credit, y'all remember Bob Bullock? Bob, by the way, Bob Bullock would be a Republican today. <laughs> yeah, so here. Uh, Bob Bullock made it very difficult, but he didn't ban it. Jerry, where's Jerry? Was that right before you came in? No, I was there. You were there? Okay. 
Yes. So uh, I assume you voted for it, right, Jerry? I voted for it. Yeah, you did. <laughs> so Jerry did great work. We're going to take it a little bit farther. There are Democrats here. In fact, I've got five Democrat opponents challenging you. Eight, five Democrats. Three of them are huge. Beto will put them up to it. Um, they, are, they are aggressively campaigning against Prop 4, which, which should tell you they want to entertain the idea of a state income tax. Who's for a state income tax? <laughs> Hopefully none of you. If you look at the states that are doing well, the states that aren't. Yeah, right. The states that aren't doing well, most of them have a state income tax, and we don't. Uh, we're going to protect your paycheck. I want to encourage you to start to spread the word to vote for Prop 4. 68%, our polling shows us that 68% of Democrat voters statewide support this proposition. So what we're going to do is we're going to go out and meet with those Democrats in our district. And we're going to tell them that this is a Republican-led initiative and that there's Democrats here that are campaigning and aggressively against it. They want, to, they want to tax your income. Talk about property taxes, sales taxes, whatever. They want, they want to enact a state income tax in Texas. Maybe not now, but possibly eight years from now. That would be disastrous. So vote uh, for Prop 4. Um, we're going to continue to fight for life, for liberty, for freedom, for the rule of law. Look, we did not get everything right this session, and I'll be the first to admit it. I'll be the first to admit it. And uh, we got we work never, to do. We never have. Do what? We never have. Thank you, Jerry. We never right. have. That's right. Um, but I believe, and I hope you do too, and I'll say this in closing, that um, Texas is worth fighting for. If we lose Texas, if we lose Texas, and there's Democrats across this country that believe that they can win Texas and turn it blue, this is going to if we lose Texas, we lose this country. If we win Texas, which I believe we will, we save America. And I think that the heart of that battle for Texas is right here in Colorado, right here in Plano, Allen, McKinley, Frisco, Richardson, Dallas, Prosper, Salina, all those, all those cities. All right. So, um, are you up for the fight? Um, can I take any questions? You have to all right. Any, any questions or comments? Yes, sir. Why would the Democrats? Uh, because they think they can win. Yeah, yeah but this has been a Republican county for one day and also a member, but it over all the above. And it would seem like Dixie, Dixie and I would not agree with you on that. The scale. <laughs> Texas is a state. This yeah. isn't the place you're gonna win. It. Well the the um, no it's a, I would have believed you if you would have asked me on November fifth whether that was true of last year, I would have said absolutely. This is Nevada County. Mm -hmm. It's Republican, it's one of the reddest counties in the state. In the country. In the country. Ask any president, ask George W. Bush when he campaigned for president, Dixie, Fred, Jerry, you remember this? Every presidential candidate knew that the heart of red Republican ran right through Collin County in North Texas. That changed last November. Matt Shaheen in HD 66, Brian McCall's former district, vast majority of Brian McCall's district, won by less than 300 votes. I typically in 2000 and uh, 14, 16, and 16, and let's see, yeah, 2012, 14, and 16, the, the spread of our margin against Democrats, I mean, I didn't even have a Democrat in my first race. Jerry, did you ever have a Democrat run against Once. you? Once. in she 16 dropped out, basically. Yeah, uh, because they knew they couldn't win. Yeah. Um, it was 16%, 10% last year, I won by 2.25%. Now, a lot of that was the Beto effect, the Cruz effect, the down ballot effect, for it's a midterm election, you've got a president that uh, we will all support, but that is largely uh, hated by the other side. Look, hate is a large motivating factor for all the opposition. They hate our president, and they're coming for us. And yeah. so, um, um, and point, but the population has changed so much. Uh, the numbers, I have the numbers, but well, around 100,000 voters, but there's 94 people uh, a day moving to Collin County, and most of them are not native Texans. Okay, I mean they're from the north and the south. You want to build a wall? Let's build it. I was going to say we're building it on the wrong side of the state. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah but, that, but that's changing. That, that is true. The demographics are changing, but I do want to add that you're, you're right, Richard. But I do want to let you know that that our polling would show that even across the state, even here in Collin County, the folks that are moving. You hear a lot about the folks that are moving from California, and they're bringing the liberal. I, they're, these folks aren't liberal. Uh, largely, they're apolitical, but they're not your people. They're not coming from San Francisco, okay? They're coming from uh, our, our 
a lot of them that we've met with, a lot of them who live in my neighborhood, are open to voting Republican. They actually voted Republican in California. Um, not all of them, but a lot of them. His, his Hispanics, our, our growing Hispanic population in the state of Texas, they believe in Republican principles. We gotta do a better job messaging to them. They're largely pro-life, they're pro-small business, they're pro-freedom, they're pro-limited government. They, they stand for the tenets of the Republican Party. We just gotta communicate with them. So, uh, but but we're we're a target. There's no question about it. Yes, sir. Talking to this dem demographics issue, I don't think there's a single person on my block in the line who was born in the state of Texas. But where I see the biggest problem is not the people coming into the state from outside. I see what's coming out of our high schools and out of our universities. Mm -hmm. That's where the problem is. And we need to take a look at that. I remember driving through Washington before the last election on the Friday night, which I'll never do again. And all I saw were black ghetto t-shirts. Yeah. Uh, the legislature really has to start looking at our state university systems where if the following national average, 87% of the faculty are progressive and dealing with that. Uh, and my warning to all Republicans would be the biggest single issue to drive Democratic voters is forgiving college loans. We need an answer to that one because Looking at a small state income tax versus, oh wow, I can get rid of a hundred thousand dollars in student loans. Sure. Okay, Jeff, how, how can we help you? Well, um, let, let me let me comment on that, and then I'll, I'll talk about that. Um, I, that's a great point. The, there's two people groups, population groups, demographic groups, I should say, that that Republicans overwhelmingly are struggling with nationwide, including in Comcast. Millennials which I'm not sure if I'm a millennial or not. I think I'm like on the other one. Jerry, you're definitely not a millennial. And suburban women. I'm really glad y'all are here tonight because for the suburban women in Collin County, I, can I be honest with you? I know I'm being reported. I don't care. Uh, the Republicans have a messaging problem with suburban women. We do. All of us. All of us own that. All of us own that together. Um, we, uh, we have women, Republican women in Collin County. Our polling would suggest that um, about 25% of suburban women, don't quote me exactly on these numbers, that voted last fall, voted straight ticket Democrat, and they had Republican voting history. Why is that? There's two reasons. Number one is they were captured by Beto's nonsense. That's not gonna be a problem anymore because now they know, all of us know where Beto stands on some issues. And number two, it's a lot, a lot to do with the president. Just if, if you find yourself knocking on doors, Fred, and you're arguing with suburban women about an AR-15, you're having the wrong discussion with the suburban women. <laughs> okay? okay, let's just be real about that. Okay. Um, now, now, if you're if you're having an argument about a woman and protecting her Second Amendment right to defend herself against intruders, people who may attack her at her home when she's getting out of her car when she's shopping, that's the conversation that we need to have. Mm -hmm. Because the number of women, suburban women across the state who've gone and applied for LTCs to arm themselves has, has skyrocketed in recent years. So it's not that our suburban women, specifically our educated voters, are against the Second Amendment. They don't understand why we need to have an AR-15. So don't get into the AR-15 discussion with them. Let's talk, yeah, okay. Okay, and I hope everybody in the room knows this, but already there are six confirmed Democrats running against our incumbent judges yeah. and the new position. You do know that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you asked me, Richard, what you can do, and I'll, I'll wrap this up. Um, we got rid of straight ticket, uh, not straight ticket, but one punch voting. Mm -hmm. In 2017, the last legis legislative session, we did away with, with one punch voting at the state level. There are some po positives. There are perhaps some unintended consequences about that. Um, I see some of our judges here tonight, our county commissioners. 
folks who are going to be on the ballot next November. They are counting on you. Andrea Strip Thompson is counting on you. Are you on the ballot in November? Yes, and I have a Democrat. You are. You have a Democrat. So does, um, I think, I think, look, every Republican is going to have a Democrat opponent next November. And if you don't go and tell your friends and our Republicans across the county to go down ballot, it's going to take a lot longer. Neil, you know this. And this is actually something I'm worried about. The logistics of our voting locations, you can no longer go in and take five minutes to vote. Uh, I've been concerned about this all along. And frankly, we're still working on the whole countywide voting issue, but it's going to take you 15 minutes to go vote. And we're working with the governor's campaign and the RNC and frankly, the Trump campaign. Uh, they're very involved in Texas. Going back to your question about how Texas is, you should see how much attention the Trump campaign is putting on Texas. A lot of money, a lot of resources. We got to train our voters to go down ballot. You're going to have a lot of Democrats going to the poll, voting for whoever's running against Trump. They may vote for Elizabeth Warren, but they won't go down ballot. Hopefully. But our Republicans have to. So, Richard, that's one way we can start to get the word out, is to make sure all of our people know take the time to go race by race all the way down. 15 minutes may not be a bad thing. Millennials won't wait that <laughs> well, I hope millennial Republicans will wait that long. That's another issue. I hope because there are millennial Republicans. There's a lot of we're doing some great outreach at Collin College and at UTD. Um, I, I sure hope that our Republican millennials will wait that long. Um, we got to start talking about that now. Does that make sense? All right, Richard. What else? Any other questions? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, Neil's got one. Just wanted to keep in mind, not only do you have non-straight ticket voting where you have to punch every ballot, you have a brand new voting system. Yeah. And granted, it will be demonstrated and people will start using it this November for the Constitutional Amendment election. Most of the people voting in the primaries, the first time they ever use this voting system will be in the primary. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Question? Yeah. Uh, we can't vote straight ticket, but, but surely every line item has got the public and the Democrat. Sure, we you've got the parentheses already. Straight Republican. We need to change the nomenclature to the vote straight Republican every time. We That's change, right. Just change the concept. That's right. And we, we're working on some messaging. We're talking about, you know, like an all the way down type messaging for Republicans. The Democrats are already <coughs> working on uh, registering new voters and, and kind of training them to go mm -hmm. all the way down ballot. Every race matters. Do you know that, that the Democrat sweeps? I don't see any appellate judges here in Dallas County, folks. Uh, we lost 750 years of judicial experience in one election last November. Most of our Republican judges, okay, you know this, who've been on the bench for a long time, great judges, and it wasn't about their experience or their qualifications or their credentials. It's all about Beto. It's the wave election because you had people going in and voting straight ticket Democrats, so all our Republican judges got wiped out. So we believe, and our polling would suggest, that in places like Dallas County and Harris County, blue counties, that we can actually win some of those seats back. Does that make sense? Because we're going to have Republican candidates working hard and training their voters to go all the way down. I'm always very interested in the senior citizen vote. Yeah. And I promote that because I, all my friends are senior citizens. But I'm your friend. Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> 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 you know, I'm not your friend. Too much. Yeah. I did not want it changed that you couldn't straight party vote. Because that's what I would tell them. If you will go and vote in early voting, you don't have to take very long. And you can punch number so and so, and it votes straight Republican. Okay, y'all came and wiped it out for me, so I'm going to have a little harder time promoting seniors. And they vote, and they go early. Mm -hmm. And I, I always try to encourage everybody to early vote on election day because you might get sick, or you might do this or that. <clears throat> If the Republican Party, God love us, we've got to stick together and quit trying to do a lot of other things 
and solely work for our candidate. Yes. Because everybody hates our president, or they seem to, and I like him. And I think he's done a good job. I think he's done a good job. But everybody that we have needs to really concentrate on what they're doing and how they got there and why they're there. And then I think we can win our election back again. But we've got a lot of hard work this time. Says in response to what Dixie said. Um, I don't think everybody hates the president. I know what you're saying. People either love him or they hate him. Mm -hmm. There's not a whole lot of in between with our. It's not like we got a lot of Americans who are kind of lukewarm on the president right now. Um, what we got to do is get the people who love the president or cannot stand the Democrats, Dixie. The Democrats of today, as you know, as you know, as all of you know, have gone so far left now radically espousing, Richard, the tenets of socialism. The Bob, there are no more Bob Bullock Democrats anymore. There's just not. And so let's beat them. Let's beat them. Because they've got a very different vision for America. For they Texas. came into Houston and wanted to eliminate fracking in Texas. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Thank you all so much. I love you all. Now, I asked earlier, and uh, I'm going to repeat it. Do you know who your county agent is? And do you know what function he has? Any of you have a garden at home? No. Any of you have a small garden? Not anymore? Okay. Any of you have any cattle? Anybody in your business? <laughs> okay. This young man I met four or five months ago. Yeah, something like that. All right. Something like that. Quite impressive. Now, I said this earlier and I'll repeat it. I mean, when I grew up in Hill County, it was a toss up whether the road commissioner, Dale, or the county agent was the most important. When I was a senior year, I had 20 acres of cotton, and I was the first one in Hill County to use liquid fertilizer. Okay, everybody came out. That was a big deal, if you can imagine liquid fertilizer. You come up and tell us about the advanced and, and what, what are you famous for in there, Chase? Come on up, young man. Well, thank you very much. Okay. Yes, sir, I do. Uh, well, I, I do want to start this off by saying, Richard, can you just like open up every talk I ever give? I'm like, man, I never knew I was so impressive. But in any case, thank y'all for having me out tonight. And in good old Aggie fashion, I'm going to start it off with the howdy. Howdy. Right? Howdy. Now, you know, I appreciate, you know, y'all let me uh, come to y'all's meeting and give a little uh, presentation about what I do and what my agents, what the agency I work for does for the people in Collin County and across the state. Um, you know, and really, you know, kind of, you know, just a couple bullet points on, you know, what, you know, if we could just leave here with these couple things, I'd just like for us to know, you know, what is AgriLife Extension? What do we do? You know, because we, you know, we help, you know, we, we teach people, you know, Liquid fertilizer is good. You can spread it out a lot easier. You can fine tune that mixture. You can get exactly what your plants need better, right? In some cases. And, you know, but we also do a lot of home and garden, right? I talk to people all the time. How do they grow tomatoes better? How can we get St. Augustine to just grow in Collin County and not, you know, and be green? Yeah. That's right. uh, but also, you know, everything from, you know, running cattle. How can we improve our herds? We're having, you know, if we're having a disease outbreak, how do we manage that? You know, there's a lot that goes into it. And, you know, I'm always, I mean, I'm, I'm a little bit biased. I think it's pretty cool. I think we do good work. Um, and so I just wanted to share a little bit about that. And then a little bit about the state of agriculture in Oregon <coughs> County. And that middle part's one of my favorites because I love going into groups and talking about how we still have a whole lot of agriculture in Collin County. Right? And, you know, especially, you know, man, I, I said that to some people, and their eyes get real big, and I'm like, that's right. <laughs> uh, and then just a little bit about, you know, specifically what um, we're doing in agriculture and natural resources to support our farm operations, to support our residents, our landowners, and our economy here. And so that's just a quick bullet point with a picture of some good-looking wheat from this past May. Uh, 
And I always, so I like to start this off with a little bit about me. You know, I'm not just some mindless government guy with a cowboy hat sitting over there in your candy. You know, I went to it, went to Texas A&M, got one piece of paper from it. Then they hooked me to get a second piece of paper from it. And then I decided I was going to go work in Michigan for one winter. <laughs> and then I decided I was going to come back and work for Texas A&M. All right. Um, and so really, you know, when I, my academic and personal specialties are in rangeland management, brush control. Um, I've got a minor or a, a bachelor's in spatial science, all that mapping stuff, uh, forestry. My master's is in ecosystem science and management. I've done a whole lot of things and I've been here for a little over a year now and I've been so happy to be back in the Metroplex. I grew up uh, over in Tarrant County in the South Lake Grapevine area. You know, and then before I ended up in College Station for about eight years, and then I'm coming back up here, I'm just like, oh, God, the air is so nice and dry. It's not cute. I forgot what life without humidity was like almost. Um, but, you know, some of my interests, you know, I help run a 500-acre ranch that my family owns down in Coriel County uh, near Gatesville. And if you really know Coriel County, it's near Pearl, where they have a bluegrass festival every Saturday. Um, or every first Saturday of every month. But, uh, you know, we actively manage it for uh, wildlife and fisheries, and it's not on here, but one of my favorite things to do, professionally and recreationally, is work with prescribed fire as a management tool, as a way to restore a lot of our native grasses, and to also bring a lot of vigor into our existing pasture grasses. Um, and that's just, I always like to mention it, and, you know, it's just about, I mean, personally, it's just something that makes my socks roll up and down. I just, I, it's so much fun. And you mean, you, you mean I get to go like the 170 acres on fire if people like it? Yeah. Uh, in any case, as I digress, that's enough about me. Uh, <laughs> um, so what is AgriLife Extension? Um, just a quick show of hands. How many of y'all have ever interacted with this in some way, shape, form, or fashion? All right, a couple, good. So. Glad that, you know, hopefully we've been really helpful for you. I know I do my best. Yep, I know my cattle operation. Good. <clears throat> and, uh, and so, for those of you who might not be as familiar with us, you know, sometimes we are kind of a little bit, I don't want to say we're kind of like a poorly kept secret, but especially, you know, it's easy to look past us. Because, um, you know, what we do is we're actually the state cooperative extension service for Texans. And what that basically means is back in 1914, um, or thereabouts, you know, they, uh, the Congress enacted the Smith Lever, Smith Lever Act, which basically took the land-grant universities and said, hey, land-grant universities, you're going to have an extension service. And what that extension service is charged with is taking the research that is being done at those land-grant universities and translating it so that the farmer, the resident, and the general public can use that and apply it in a you know good fashion, right? With the goal of basically improving their operation, helping them make more money, helping them become, you know, improving their lives, right? And so then this goes on through the years, and what it ends up doing <coughs> is that cooperative extension is called cooperative because you know there's kind of I like to think of it as a three-legged stool. The first leg is the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Now that USDA money is kind of way, you know, it comes in up top and filters down low. And then we have the state, the leg of it, that's the state agency. So that's the Texas A&M University system that, you know, through which AgriLife is run. And then what we have, what I are, you know, would consider almost to be the most important part is the county. So, you know, there's a reason I have a state badge and a county badge. I'm actually an employee of both, and we're very blessed here in Collin County to have good support from our commissioners. And, you know, I've been, you know, without support from all of these groups, our work wouldn't get done, right? And um, so, you know, let's see, and every, st every state in the United States has an extension <coughs> agency. You know, again, it's through their land grade university. Um, we also have a secondary cooperative extension service through Prairie View a and They focus more on um, underrepresented communities and um, lower income groups across the state. And you know, we have 250 offices that cover 254 counties. So if you're in Loving County, where you have 179 mm -hmm. people, I think, you have to share. But everyone else, <laughs> they generally get their own. <laughs> um, and you know, the 
way our model works is that the education we provide is, you know, from, you know, it's a grassroots deal, it's from the ground up, right? We don't come in with a state level, hey, you need to do this. It comes from what are our needs in our county and how can we best address them through education, through the application of research, and through community development. And I'll go into that a little bit later as to how that whole process works. But um, just suffice to say, that's like the lightning fast summary. Um, and you know, when we look at as an agency, what is our vision? Help Texans better their lives, right? And so when I come in the office, my goal, you know, I help people do better. You know, whether they call in on the phone asking about why there's funny spots in their lawn, whether it's someone who maybe they've got an overstocked pasture and they don't, they aren't sure how how can they reduce the amount of hay they have to feed, right? You know, or maybe we have someone who's uncertain about you know what's the importance of exercise. You know, what what are the healthy foods we need to be eating? You know, we work through all of that and we do that through by providing unbiased research-based information. So anything that you see that comes out of our office is based in the research that's been done at Texas A&M or equivalent institutions. So when I tell you that, hey, you know, if you put down one pound of nitrogen twice a, twice a year, you know, in the growing season on your Bermuda grass, it's going to maintain its greenness better than, you know, this, that, or the other. Or we need to stop watering our lawns generally in the wintertime because you can build fungal disease potentially, right? And, there's, and, we, and we can say that with confidence because that's what the research has shown us. Now up here, you should probably water your house in the winter time, but you don't, your lawn doesn't necessarily need it. And that goes into soil chemistry and all sorts of other fun things that, you know, if you really want to know, I can go down that path later on with you. Um, so here in Collin County, uh, in our extension office, we're billeted for five extension agents. Um, right now, we have three of them, obviously. I'm agriculture and natural resources. Um, we're also billeted for horticulture agent. Um, we have. Uh, we currently have a family community health agent, uh, Ms. Andy Tinsley. Uh, we have a Better Living Protection Texans position that uh, we're uh, waiting to be filled. And then we have Amanda Parks, who is our 4-H and youth development agent. And so between all of us at the office, we cover the whole county. And generally, we'll have an answer for what you call in with. Uh, now, I will preface this with my answer might be, I don't know, give me a minute. You know, or maybe I can connect you with someone who does know. But, you know, we are here as a resource. And, uh, but, uh, let's see. And so in the county, we're also lucky we have a very robust group of master volunteers. Our master volunteers are, are basically trained volunteers who go out and represent extension to the general public, right? Because at the end of the day, there's only one of me. And I can only be in one spot at one time. But we have almost 500 master volunteers who go out and do a lot of good whether that's our master gardeners, who you know they run they run our research and demonstration gardens out at Myers Park, you know they're also they have booths, they teach classes. Caldwell Elementary in McKinney, they have an after school garden club. That we were at the first session, they had near on 80 kids, right? And so every Monday they get together and they have a garden club experience where they're teaching kids about you know what are healthy vegetables, what do plants need to grow, you know what is the connection between the food we grow and what we pick at, you know, Kroger, right? Because there's a lot of people who don't always know that, you know, think that steaks just come off a styrofoam tray. <laughs> yeah, pro tip, they don't. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, and so our master volunteers, we have, um, you know, three primary groups. We have our uh, master gardeners, we have the Blackwood Prairie master naturalists, and then we have our master wellness volunteers. And, um, yeah, and between those po folks, I pulled the numbers, I think a month or two ago, and in 2018, that was almost 34,000 hours of volunteering. So they are active. Um, and if you do a little bit of math and figure that they're worth, their time's worth 20 bucks an hour, that's about $650,000 worth of effort. So, um, and then over that past, over that same time frame, they also made contact with over a million people, right? Again, we look at what I can do. You know, even if I were to run around and preach on the street corner, extension, you know, mulch your grass clippings, all that, I couldn't hear. And so, I always like to brag on my master volunteers; they're great. You know, and uh, we also have our 4-H program, right? So, you know, and we have 11 clubs. I think 
Yeah, I think we're still at 11. We have 355 kids, and uh, they do everything. So 4-H, you know, of course, you got the livestock. You know, you got, you're selling chickens, you're selling animals, livestock. You know, but we also do a lot of other things. We have leadership in public speaking competitions every year. We go down to AM Commerce, and all our, all our 4-H kids from Fort Worth to Texarkana go to AM Commerce. They compete in public speaking. They complete, they compete in shooting sports. I'm a judge for our district shooting sports team. Right, so when they punch all the holes in the paper, I'm gonna go with the pencil circling them. But you know, they're very active in a whole wide range of different activities. And you know, uh, see, they're they're generally more impressive than I ever was when I was that age. I'll put it that way. Um, so that's just a little bit again about extension, kind of what we do. Yeah, you know, what's the basis for what we're doing? Um, so now a little bit about agriculture in Collin County. Yeah, 2019. Cause that's the year it is. So I always like to start off, we still have a robust agricultural economy, right? Now, you know, the proportion of the total county economy, you know, when we look at, you know, our great growth in industry and business and finance, you know, they brought a ton of wealth, you know, into the county. We still maintain a good amount of that, of the ag economy as well, right? Now, it's slowly moving north, um, but we have a large number of producers and we have a very diverse, amount uh, types of commodities that we grow, right? You know, in some areas you go out, what do they grow? They grow corn, they grow sorghum, or milo, depending on what part of the state you're in. It's the same thing, just different name, or they're growing wheat, you know, maybe soybeans if, you know, the market price is awful. Um, and that's about it. But here in Collin County, we got a lot of stuff. I'll, I've got a whole slide where I just kind of like to go through it. But you know, the reason that we have a wide variety of agriculture is because there's a demand for it. You know, we have a lot of small acreage farmers. All they do is they grow vegetables, they produce meat that goes down to the restaurants in McKinney, in Dallas. There's a huge demand for local food products and our landowners and farmers have risen to match that, right? And, you know, uh, let's see. And so, and then of course we have our you know, farmers markets all across our cities, and then a lot of direct-to-consumer sales. So uh, I think it's Reeves Family Farm over there by Melissa. You know, they have a big old okra picking festival every year. And they I, they grow like three, five acres of okra. And if you've ever grown okra, you know that once you get that in the ground, you're picking okra twice a day for months. You better really, really like the taste of okra. Um, or have a lot of friends that really like it or something like that. But, you know, there, so there's a lot of opportunity in the production as well as in connecting with the consumers. Um, so what do we grow? Well, we grow our traditional grain commodities. We have corn, we've got wheat, we've got sorghum. Um, cotton has been kind of coming back. You know, of course, this year was just an agricultural disaster, basically. So we'll have to see if they grow it next year. Um, you know, not up there that I get calls about all the time is hemp. That is a thing. People are excited about it. It's still illegal to grow it, so no one's growing it. Legally. I don't know anyone growing it. <laughs> don't tell me if you're growing it. Um, so we also, have a lot of, we also have a lot of vegetable and orchard products uh, or production. So, and that's, I mean, from hydroponics and aquaponics, you know, again, growing greens, growing you know, all sorts of custom hydroponic products for direct restaurants. We have a lot of fruit production, um, peach orchards, plums, uh, a lot, we've got some pecan operations still. I think we only have, we're down to one pecan cracking group left up over by Anna. And then specialty vegetables, right? And honey is a big deal. I'll go into that in a little bit, but we have a lot of honey production, both from you know, people producing it as well as leasing their land for honey production. Uh, livestock, you know, beef cattle, chickens, sheep, goats. I had someone come in and ask me if they could raise New Zealand Cooney Cooney grass eating pigs. I was like, what? <laughs> uh, and I looked it up and, you know, we talked about it and kind of figured out what it would take to do that. But we've got people who are willing to go out and meet these niche markets, right? You know, we've got, you know, just fun ag fact of the day, you know, for every pound of uh, lamb we produce for domestic consumption, we have to import two pounds of it, right? Because we are not able to meet this demand. Just on a 
statewide level and a national level. Also, Texas is by far and large the biggest producer, producer of sheep in the U.S., in fact. Um, but, we have a lot of, but we have a lot of landowners who are stepping up to that because you can raise acreage, you can raise sheep on acreage that you couldn't necessarily raise cattle on because they graze differently, right? And so there's a lot of opportunity there. Uh, we also have recreational livestock, horses, and if you're a horse person who says that their horses aren't recreational, I, I, I understand. But uh, by and large, they're mostly recreational. And then uh, we have a lot of show animals. So again, going back to the 4-H FFA, they gotta get their cows from somewhere, y'all. Um, same thing with their goats, their rabbits, etc. cetera. Uh, here's one of our uh, local honey producers, uh, Desert Creek <coughs> Honey. They're actually like right on the county line up over by Blue Ridge. Uh, but he is a huge honey producer. And I've got some cool pictures. We went on a tour there the other week, the other month. And here's a fun map. So when we look at ag use across the county, that's it. That's it. So I pulled those in December of 2018. And, you know, it's all color coded and all that good stuff that, you know, makes a map geek like me very happy. Uh, but basically, depending on where you're looking, we're still between probably 30 and 50% ag use in the county some way, shape, form, or fashion. Now, ag use, depending on your definition of that, you know, at the appraisal district, you know, wildlife management is acceptable ag use. You know, from the USDA's perspective, you for the US Department of Agriculture's perspective, if you're not growing and producing on it and it's not in cropland reserve programs or anything, that might not be counted as agriculture, right? So just depends on whose definitions. But you know, that's about where we're at. Um, you know, and about half our farms operate on 10 to 50 acres, right? And they're averaging about 25 acres at this point. You know, I think 2018, we were looking at about almost $78 million worth of economic value. About 66.8 million of that was from direct commodity sales. So we're, you know, that's, that's the grain sorghum that's going in the elevator, that's the vegetables being put on the truck, you know, the goats being sold at the auction. Um, and if you also put it on a graph, here's a graph of basically um, agricultural production value in dollars from 1992 to 2017. Notice it goes about like that, right? With a little blip in there because crop prices weren't doing so hot after about 2012. But uh, you know, generally the trend is increasing because the, why is this? We're more productive on the acreage we have. We can raise more animals, we can raise more crops, more efficiently, and more better, to use an Aggie term, right? <laughs> um, yeah, and so here, blue is just the added value of crops and livestock. Yeah, now, this one's fun, because if we look at the number of, farm, of uh, farm operations and the average size of that operation, they're exactly opposite. So we've almost, since 1992, we've, almost, we've uh, more than doubled the number of farms in the county, and they pretty much have an acreage. So, again, what does that tell us? You know, that means that people are still wanting to farm. We have people who are moving, maybe they weren't able to own acreage before and they're at a point where, hey, maybe it's worth that extra 30 minute commute to be able to own 10 acres and raise, you know, some goats, right? Um, you know, people are still moving to Collin County. As a part of that, a lot of our large acreage farms you know, just like a 200 parcel, 200 acre parcel of crop of corn, you know, that's being divvied up. You know, probably, you know, sometimes in the subdivisions, but it's also being divvied up into 20 acre ranchettes, right? You know, now again, people, well, they have 20 <coughs> acres now. What do they want? That they want that ag valuation. So what do they do? They get into ag production, right? And you know, typically that, as far as what they get into, that that's just anything. Like I said, I, I've heard a little bit of everything as far as what people want to do and help them through that process. But, you know, we've got hay, you know, people cutting hay, wildlife management, vegetable orchard crops, livestock, just depends on their acreage, what they like to do. You know, I'll have people come in and say, hey, well, I've got 50 acres, what can I do with them? Like, well, what do you like to do, right? Because my whole goal is if you like doing, if you like what you're doing, you're going to treat the land right. We, you know, we want our landowners to be good, you know, conservationists, right? We want to do what's right by the land so that it doesn't, you know, go, so it doesn't get wrong. Um, but, 
let's see, honey production has picked up. So it wasn't too terribly long ago that honey production was considered a, a uh, at the state level, that was actually made a, 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 a adequate agricultural use. So if you have between five and 20 acres, you can grow honey on it. Nice thing about growing honey is you can do a lot of other things on there too, right? So if you have 20 acres, maybe you have a big fishing pond and you just like to keep it mowed and pretty, but you don't want to put livestock on it, well, that's just fine. You can put some bees on there, they'll do their bee thing. and. You know, you can either be a beekeeper yourself. There's folks like Desert Creek Honey where they'll actually put bees on your property, you know, just like as if you were to lease it for cattle. So that's been a big deal. Of course, as we've all seen, it's kind of nice being able to buy Texas honey. And, you know, especially when you get the good, you know, you know it's good when it's like that real dark tint to it, almost like Dr. Pepper. You can like taste the flowers. It's good stuff. Uh, but in any case, so that's just kind of a quick, so we know what AgriLife does. We know that there's still agriculture here. So what does Extension Ag Education look like, right? Because it's not just, you know, I don't just sit in the office and answer the phone all day. I mean, it sometimes feels like that. But one of my biggest charges is that as an educator, right? I am, you know, and one of the things I enjoy is going out and actually teaching classes. Um, and so what does it look like? Well, you know, putting on classes. You know, I, I tend to split them up into two kinds, in-house and partner, partner programs. So the in-house programs are ones that, you know, about this time every year I sit down and my boss says, Chase, you need to get all your plans for 2020 figured out. And I'm like, yes, sir. And so I sit down and plan out everything for 2020. All right, in January, we're doing a vegetable production workshop. In February, we're doing pond management. You know, from April to August, we're doing our Landowner 101 class series, you know, all of that stuff. And then we have what I call partner programs. And so that's when someone like City of Frisco says, hey, Chase, let's put on, let's, you know, we were trying, what are we thinking about doing this, you know, native prairie walk? You know, we want to try to get our, you know, residents to learn about why we're doing this natural area management. And so I'm like, sweet. So last Monday we went, we did a prairie walk. And, you know, we had some people come out, we walked them through the prairies, like, hey, you know, why, you know, there's a reason this park isn't just mowed grass anymore. Right? Why are they letting you grow tall? Well, there's a neighborhood right here and a creek right here. We let the grass grow tall. It filters out, you know, any herbicides that are coming with it. It helps filter out any fertilizer that's coming with it. You know, it's, it uh, conserves our water, helps us have cleaner water, which, you know, we all like. If we go into Levon Lake and go fishing, we like being able to eat the fish we catch. Um, so stuff like that. Then, you know, so outside of the ad actual educational programs where I'm going up and teaching and have PowerPoints and all that other good stuff, you know, I have information and technical guidance, right? So that's people calling in, sending me emails. Um, they'll come into my office, you know, we'll schedule a time, sit down, visit about some things. I also have people just kind of drop in and, you know, all right, let's visit. What's going on? Um, and then one of my favorite parts of my job, honestly, is I get to do a lot of site visits. So people call me, it's like, hey, look, I've got 20 acres. I've it just in these gully washers of a rain have been just eroding out my pasture. Well, what do we do? So I go over there. I, you know, I've got some friends in the Soil and Water Conservation District and the USDA, and we'll all go over there and we'll look at it. It's like, hey, look, here's the deal. So given this area, you know, if you get your tractor, kind of smooth this out, plant these grasses on it, you know, and oh by the way, you know. There's some resources, you know, here's some cost share programs you might be eligible for, you know, stuff like that, right? So, because that's my opportunity, well, to get out of the office, but also to go and interact with our clientele, to interact with our residents, our producers, figure out what's going on. Because usually, you know, they've got that one thing, but there is also other things that are bothering them, right? Maybe they've noticed that, hey, you know, I just built this fence and a bull keeps running through it. How do I keep a bull from running through this fence? It might not be why I, was, why I originally went out there, but you know, we're there to help solve that, solve that issue. Um, also do a lot of outreach and support. So career days, school visits, uh, do a lot of those. Um, come out and give presentations like this to an audience like y'all. Um, and then I do a lot of community involvement and support. And so, um, I do, basically I go out into the community 
and I'm on different boards and groups and stuff like that. You know, if I were, if my boss said, Chase, what do you do? List it out for me. That's basically what it would be. And I would summarize it by other duties as required. Um, so groups I work with that I'm really, you know, proud to serve on. Um, you know, I'm with our, I'm on our county farm bureau. Uh, I work with the appraisal district when they have their ag advisory meetings every call. Um, I, Collin College is starting an ag studies program, and so they asked me to come and sit in on their advisory board for when, you know, helping determine the curriculum for that. Um, you know, work a lot with our U.S. Department of Agriculture colleagues here in the county, and you know, also on some state and national uh, committees as well. So you know, I'm on our disaster strike team. If we have another Hurricane Harvey come in, you know, it was a year before I came in, before I started. But Extension sent folks down there. We had, on four-day rotation, agents from across the state were going down there, setting up livestock supply points, handling, you know, how can we get hay to producers who need it when their animal, or when their livestock is stranded on an island? How do we handle when people are coming down with an 18-wheeler full of hay from Nebraska? What do you do with it? Well, we take it, we inventory it, we offload it, we get it to where it needs to go. So there's... You know, and uh, then of course we have TC AAA, the Texas uh, County Agricultural Agents Association, which is always a hoot to say. Um, now, when we think about how do these programs happen, right? So when I go in and every year I say, okay, well we're doing that vegetable class and the pond class. That isn't just like you know me pulling it from my sleeve. You know that sounds good, right? I think I, I like ponds. It's pretty swell. But it, it, what it actually comes out of is what we call our program area committee. So when I said that we're a grassroots organization, basically what we mean is we get people from the community together. We get leaders in the community together to sit down and visit with us, right? We, I have a uh, agriculture and natural resources board. We meet three times a year, sometimes more, depending. And so we go in and we say, hey, you know, what are, what are some of the issues we're facing in the county this year that we want to address next year? Right? What are some program ideas? You know, do we want to do a farm tour, or do we want to do more like classic workshop, or do we want to go do a you know, variety trial where we put in 30 different kinds of wheat and then have a big field trip out there? <laughs> Stuff like that. And then they're also the group that helps me put on my programs. Right? So again, there's only one of me, and, these, and the volunteers who are on these boards are able to come over and, you know, whether it's helping me check in, <coughs> You know, I've asked them, they've come and presented before, because again, usually these people are very active in the ag community. So I'll say, hey, you're really, you got really good looking pastures and really good looking cows. I'll, if you don't mind, come give a talk on how to have good looking pastures and cows. Because sometimes people like to listen to more than just the guy who works for the government, right? Um, and so without these committees, nothing happens. Um, you know, and some of the issues that these committees and groups have identified. So this past April, every five years, AgriLife goes and we do a big survey. It's like, hey, let's identify what some of the top issues uh, that need to be addressed in the county are. So what we found in our survey is that one of the biggest ones, we have a lot of new and inexperienced landowners. You know, earlier it was touched on how many people are moving into the county. And, you know, that's very true. And a lot of these people are, you know, they like to buy acreage but they aren't always coming from an ag background, right? They might not have ever owned land before. And so one of my pro, so what we need to be doing, I say we in the sense that I in extension have been directed by my committees to do is to do a lot of landowner education. Like, hey, this is, you know, this is how many animals you need to have on your acreage. If you, and this is what happens if you overstock it, right? You know, this is why, you know, make, if you have bare dirt, all that dirt's doing is filling up Levon Lake eventually. Put some grass on it, stuff like that. Um, you know, other things are the lack of exposure to agriculture education by the general public. Yeah, you know, I made the joke earlier about steak. Where does it come from? It comes on a styrofoam tray. You know, we all kind of chuckle, but it's true, right? So that's one of the reasons I like to do school visits and you know talk to the talk to kids and work with them is because you know they're the future, right? And if the future thinks that a steak comes from Kroger, not knowing that it comes from a cow, you know, or that chocolate milk comes from brown cows, which is still something. That, uh, yeah. Um, but but that's exactly what you know we're trying to reach, right? Um, yeah. And then we have water and soil conservation. I've talked about, you know, hey, how do we keep 
herbicides and you know, fertilizer out of our waterways. All right, this is how we do it. Um, invasive species and biodiversity. You know, we do have some pretty gnarly invasive species. Some things that, you know, some of it's kind of a really pretty garden flower that, you know, when it's not in your garden is kind of, you know, really invasive and will take over a pasture and nothing eats it, so it just continues to multiply, that kind of thing. You know, scabiosa, Johnson grass, all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, and then we also have, you know, with, you know, the whole biodiversity thing, there's a lot of push in the ag community to try to get a little more biodiversity. Why? Because of things, you know, like the monarch butterfly. Everybody loves the monarch butterfly. Numbers have been reducing. So we've been, so the ag community nationally has been like, all right, what can we do to try to keep these numbers up? Right, because monarch butterflies are very charismatic species. People like them. And they're an important part of our national ecosystem. So what do you do? Well, you can plant milkweed where you're not growing corn, right? You know, it didn't always, it didn't always rocket surgery, but sometimes, you know, it's just being made aware of it. Um, and then we have wildlife and habitat loss. And so, you know, we, the wildlife side, well, we all know that Frisco went through some interesting times with a couple of uh, coyotes this past year. Um, but we also have, you know, when they put in another 300 house development, where does wildlife go? How does, how does the wildlife interact with those residents? How can we teach people, you know, at that prairie tour on Monday, there were, a, you know, we finished up by a playground, a bunch of the kids in the group saw two baby bunnies. And they immediately went over there to go pet them, and I was like, no, you leave them alone. Well, why? Because they, you, know, you can get sick if you touch the bunny and then lick your fingers, you know, that's not good. Um, but also learning to respect wildlife, right? You know, keep keeping the wildlife wild so that we don't have coyote problems like that in the future. Um, let's see, so, and then that's just a big diagram that is too complicated and makes my head hurt. Um, so a little bit about what we've done so far just in the past year. So August of 2018, August 2019, I pulled these numbers you know, this afternoon. So in that one year period, just from what I was doing, it, we had about 25,042 people reached. That's basically what that contact means. You know, of those, about 8,500 of them were from educational presentations and from um, interactions like this. Um, the others came from outreach events, you know, man, having booths at public deals. So, you know, I go down to the state fair and help down, help at the AgriLife booth there every year. You know, at our garden shows here, we like to have a booth in this building because well, we help people garden a lot. So, you know, we can, we, if nothing else, we can at least give you some publications. Um, you know, over that time, about 58,000 contact hours, about two, two and a change hours per person. Um, now. This is some real Aggie math. In 12 months, I put out 12 monthly newsletters. <laughs> um, and, then I, and then on average, I do about three educational programs a month. So that's things like this. You know, I, you, I plan myself at least one program a month. And then just other things come up that I'm like, that's a really cool idea, let's do it. Um, you know, of those, 14 were uh, you know, planned workshops and formal like PowerPoint educational events. 21 of them were invited talks and presentations, again, kind of like tonight. And then in that time period, I've gone on 155 office and field visits. That's gone up. Well, because it's you know now September, and I've been out in the field <laughs> since then. Um, also, I do want to highlight one of the more fun programs we've been doing is we've been working with the Sheriff's Department and doing some inmate education, teaching work skills. You know, I'm currently in the middle of a class with, uh, with them where we have 12 inmates and we're teaching them about agriculture so that when they get out they have some skills and some knowledge that hopefully they can use to reintegrate back into the community and find meaningful employment. And so it's uh, that, that's been something that's actually been really rewarding to teach just on a personal level and you know, from an educator's perspective. Um, and so how have I been addressing some of those issues that were identified? So with the new landowner deal, this year I started up a big program, an annual program series. It's called Landowner 101. And the goal is to take someone who's never owned land before, doesn't, doesn't know which side of a cow eats and which side doesn't, you know, and you know, how can we, yeah, I am being filmed. Uh, and how can we provide them with information to be good stewards of the land, right? And whether that's just, you know, we literally had a class where we had a, one of our economists come down and say, like, how can you not make your property, how can you make your property less of a money pit? Like, because that's what people care about, right? 
you know, um, and hopefully how, how can you make a little bit of money? You know, how can you, you know, what if you have livestock, what do you need to be considering? You know, if they need water, they need food, what kind of food? What's, what's the nutrition level profile looking like for them? Um, so this year we reached 49 uh, new landowners. 26% uh, of them attended more than one class. So, you know, this was the first year doing it. I was just, I was very happy we got the attendance turnout we did, uh, the feedback. So, if you ever go to an extension program, you know it's not an extension program unless you're surveyed. Um, and so, but people really enjoyed this class. And so, we're doing it again, 2020. We're actually partnering with Dutton County because they have a lot of the same problems we do. And so, we're actually hosting it again here at Myers Park in McKinney. And we're doing our Landowner 101 class series. Um, and then we do a lot of water education programs, uh, did a couple workshops, reached 936 people through um, all of those combined, and I think that's about it. So I know that was kind of lightning fast, I'm trying to you know, keep you all awake and interested. If you have, do I have time for a couple questions? Indeed, any questions? So, if you have a sick tree, will you come out and tell us what's wrong with it, or say, uh, that I'll give you the extension answer, it depends. <laughs> uh, so, and, and yes, asterisk. So typically, you know, what I would say with something like that is we actually have a fort, uh, forester with the Texas a and Forest Service regionally, and I'd probably refer you to him, simply because he knows more about trees than I do. And so he can probably help better connect you with a solution to look at it. Um, and then it would also just you know, depend. You know, usually I'll say, send me some pictures, give me a little, back, a little bit of background. What have you been seeing? What's the time frame? Stuff like that. How about if you want to learn how to be a cowboy and you and your wife just got horses? <laughs> yes, sir. A any request to uh, raise truffles? Not yet, but I mean, hey, I'm open to it. And I, I ask this for a legitimate reason because they can improve pecan mm -hmm. yields just by having them, mm -hmm. and then you can sell the truffles for $100. Yeah. Of, yeah. 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 Then how it's, yeah. So I would say the biggest challenge with that is how keeping the feral hogs out. Because <laughs> feral hogs love <laughs> truffles. And, you know, so, but if you can exclude them, they could be really good. You know, beneficial fungi, you know, what do they do? They decompose organic material so that plants get basically free fertilizer. And then you get the, you get the truffles that you can sell or eat. Now, I will say, if you send me a picture of a mushroom and say, can I eat this? My answer is going to be, I don't know enough to say yes. Please go find someone else. <laughs> yes. Uh, but, all right. Okay, now we have some special announcements that we need to uh, cover, and uh, um, so that y'all know, uh, uh, we'll have uh, after these announcements, then we'll recognize our elected officials and candidates. I purposely do that. Most of you know why. <laughs> so right now, uh, Chuck. Why are you famous and why the Dickens are you here, young man? I, I'm here. I don't, I'm not famous. You're that. Like that. SRC yes, representative? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'm the state Republican uh, executive committee man for here in SB8. The southern portion of Collin County up to 380 and down to 635 in Richardson. So what I, I brought you with us today is that during the SRC meeting this weekend and other meetings, uh, the chairman has brought attention to the state of Texas with a red alert the presentation. I'm going to go over that real quick. Uh, Richard said I had about an hour to go and I said I'll do it in about 15 minutes and he said well no somebody else is just speaking so I said I'll do it in 10 minutes. Right? Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Is that what I'm saying? Okay. So this will hopefully answer some of the questions y'all had when Jeff was up here. He told you about some of the attacks. Why is it people are coming to Collin County? And why do they think they can flip Collin County? Uh, and what are, what can we do about it? It's, it's alarming in some in some situations, but... Uh, Technology's great when it works. There we go. Yeah. Anyone else? 
or something. That, that, that's a CD job. Mm -hmm. Hey, Chuck, did you hear what one mushroom said to the other mushroom? Okay. I look like a fun guy. Okay. <laughs> 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 that must be an engineering joke. Right? <laughs> no, I know sir, the uh, Check this right here, this USB. Check this one right here. There we go. This one right here, the 2020 turnout projection. Okay, the push is awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. All right, so Red Alert, Texas, just to get us active here in the in the county and all over Texas. Thank you. Do I is there a clicker or something? Yeah, there's one. There. This is uh, and a clicker. Which one? Is this it? Yes. Uh -huh. Okay. And uh, they just hit it like that. Okay. Awesome. So uh, this is what, what's been going on on the financial results. These are as of the date. Uh, this was earlier in the year, whenever Chairman Ridicky was here in, in the springtime. Right now we have about $2 million on hand, and it's the highest amount we've ever had in a Republican Party in Texas. This is right. Yeah, thank you, sir. Okay, so in 2018, the Republican Party of Texas, we had 14 of 14 statewide elected offices that won. It's the 12th election in a row with the national record for those one. Those did. Okay, thank you. All right. So it dominance over the Democrats. Election losses, we lost two of our 21 Texas Senate seats in the DFW area, <coughs> uh, 12 of 95 Texas House seats in DFW Houston and in the Austin area. And then 31 of 32 Texas Court of Appeal seats we lost. We lost all eight of them. And granted, here in Collin County, we actually were winning 57 to 43 percent. But because of the impact Dallas has on it, it wiped out all the other five counties, unfortunately. Uh, election losses at the U.S. level, we lost the course. Huff fines and then Culver's and down in Houston. Okay. The big warning, U.S. Senate race. So look at this. 2012, you had Cruz who won by 16 points. 2014, Cornyn won by 27 points. And then Senator Cruz only won by 2.6 in 2018. The interesting part about this, 2012, here in Collin County, Senator Cruz had 189,000 votes. 2018, he got 187,000 votes. So his vote count actually went down by 2,000 votes from 2012 to 2018. And the population is growing. Yes, sir. The population, actually, the, the uh, registered voter increased by 120,000 voters. 18 percent. Let's spin it up a little bit. All right, so, we go. so the Texas presidential vote trend. Now, look at this. So, in 2004, 23 percent, 12 percent, 2018, Texas, he, uh, uh, Romney led by 16 percent, and then Trump, 9 percent. In the state of Texas. Okay, uh, no path to 270 without Texas. Without the 38 votes, he wouldn't have won that. Congressional results. These are the Republican losses in Culberson and Sessions. These are slim votes. And again, this is why they're coming to Texas. You see how Hurt didn't get the 50%, Joe Boy barely got it. And the down, this was right here, ninth. Just barely, barely made it. Okay, so Texas House losses that we had. Look at that. Wow. Primarily in the Houston and Austin area. I believe Houston had three losses. Austin had uh, two. And then DFW. We're part of DFW, by the way. There were so what, six six losses we had in the DFW area. Okay, get Dallas, 60 40. Um, was there a difference? Look at that. Texas House races at risk. Look at the slim margins that each one of those folks won by in 2018. So for us, it's Shaheen and Leach. So we really got to push. Yes, ma'am. I'd like to ask a question. Okay. What do you attribute or what does the state attribute to people like Will Hurd and these other, I think there's what, four of them now? Uh, okay. the Congress, why are they leaving? Are they leaving? Mm -hmm. uh, she mm -hmm. didn't mention mm -hmm. that. It was, I'm just curious. Yes, ma'am. It, it was. They didn't mention that. That's a good question. I'll get the answer for you. Well, you know, this is just opening up seats that... Well, I, I, mm -hmm. you know, back in 2018, we had, what, 44 Republicans that just dropped out completely? 
44 Republicans dropping out and decide they were going to resign in the U.S. Congress. Uh, and I think that may be that they're just getting too close in the race and they, they want to step out. Uh, te total Texas registered voters. So here, here we are right here, 2014, you have 13 million. Okay, see how it's grown. In 2018, you have 15 million 793. So it increased by one point, what, what is that, 1.7? Uh, almost 1.8 million people that have increased by the total registered voters. Okay. And this is the increases where the concentration areas. That this is the Texas presidential election turnout. So in 2012, you had almost 8 million. 2016, you had 9 million. 2020, the projection is 11.5 million, two and a half more million this next election cycle in just four years for the state of Texas. How was that the run? Uh, that's just what their projections are. And that uh, primarily Carl Rowe has, has done a lot of the research, spent about $15 million coming up with that. I'll go over some more of that a little bit. This registration turnout by region. So the DFW in Houston areas, that makes up 49% of the projected statewide turnout that will come from, from those two areas alone. And so there's there's a projected turnout. What we need. The 2020, this is the Right here, this is a projected number of registered voters that we need here in the Dallas Fort Worth area, including Hong County. And this is how many of them we need to turn out the vote at 26.4 percent turnout. Okay, now here's the million related to four million, well, not 26 percent. See that? I believe what they're saying is percentage of total turnout of all registered voters, not, not, not just these. Oh, okay. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, this right here, this this should answer your question. So this is why, if you notice the trend, back here in 2014, you had, this is Collin County, uh, this is DFW, Houston, this is Austin and San Antonio, 2014, 2016 at flips. So DFW, you still have, you're in the positive, but you've gone down by 175,000 votes. Over here, Houston's gone down from 185, to negative 15 from well, from 221 down to negative 15,000, and then Austin's taking a dip even further, and now um, <coughs> San Antonio's dip down. This was 2018. All of those were taken down by the Democrats. Okay. So Red Alert Texas, the mission is we projected 11.5 million votes in 2020. We'll need 5.8 million for a majority. Trump got 4.7 votes in 2016. Abbott got 4.7. We must turn out 1.1 million more Texas Republican voters in 2020. And two thirds of those must be in the targeted account. <clears throat> what will it take to win? So this is what what we're working on. The RPT is uh, projecting to raise about 10. $10 million from op for operations and $11 million from uh, big trade. <coughs> what are they doing? They've already they've got field staff that are coming out. So the great thing is what Jeff was saying earlier is that the, good, the great thing is RPT, got RPT, Abbott's team, and you got Trump team all working together right now. They're, I mean, they're, they've got a machine going, which is phenomenal. Um, you'll see April Lenahan, she's with RPT, she's been here. Great. She'll bring people in from Tarrant and Denton County. That's what they did with some of the municipal elections. Um, you've got the Trump team. They're also working hand in hand with us as well. And uh, the other team. So how do we defend Texas? Hiring and training field staff, recruiting candidates, make sure any area that has a Democrat, whether they want, you know, if they want in the past, go ahead and get someone to run against them training candidates and volunteers. So they come out with the Leadership Institute to train candidates and volunteers. Those, um, the candidates themselves, get them familiar, any newbies that are coming out, making sure that they're aware of what it takes to actually run the campaign. Because most most people, when they go into campaigns that I used to, they're like a deer in headlights. <coughs> Registering voters, including the new tech system. This is a great system. They can now use the tech system. Remember, I, I'm sure some of y'all got Text from Beto and, and those guys asking to get out and vote. Uh, the RBT has a, a system now rolling out new systems and processes in municipal 
uh, school board and con uh, constitutional elections. Great thing is this year we got really involved as far as our RPT. We got the Plano elections, we got uh, Allen elections, and a little bit with the Frisco. Uh, we're the only, by the way, Collin County is the only one who actually did that and got the RPT involved. So we need to be grateful for that and uh, get their help. Field staff locations and focus. So in the DFW re uh, region, the focus is on Hispanic, African Americans, and the Asian voters. I would recommend also the Indian vote as well would be a great group for us to reach out to. Um, so the Abbott campaign, they've got five different areas of focus. It is gonna be the youth. Those are the, the uh, high school students and their parents. They're gonna work on the young Republicans and college students, TFRW. They're focusing on the Hispanics and the minority engagement as well. Other minority engagement. Okay. Sorry. <coughs> All right, so these are some of the tools. Um, have people go out there and text if you need somebody who isn't engaged or hasn't registered to vote, TX vote to 72,000. They'll, they'll get the information sent to them. Um, another thing that we're doing, we're improving block walking and phone banking application options. Um, here's the cool thing. So back in July, uh, Chairman Dickey went to the, uh, to the summer meeting that the RNC had. He was the only person there that could say that he had block walkers in his state. Pretty cool, huh? You know where those blocker, block walkers were? Right here in Collin County. We were the only ones block walk in the whole United States. Pretty awesome, huh? That's why I keep telling you, we're leaders. New app, map and a events counter on the Texas GOP. Go out and look those out. Um, make sure every Republican leaning person you know is out there registering to vote. <coughs> Refer excellent potential support to Republican municipal and school board candidates to prepare their constitutional election. Right here, this is important. Um, the Democrats have gotten so involved during the Allen election against uh, Benny Brooks and Chris Schulmeister, they had people sending postcards from California out to, to some of the voters. Fortunately, we squeaked one of those out with Chris Schulmeister. He won by four points. Uh, Bain, he's, he's a machine, so he's going to try to see anything that comes in front of him. Great, great guy. But uh, anyway, so that's uh, that's the end of the, my presentation. One of the things that we've got here, these are the new cards for engagement, Republican versus a Democrat. I've got some of those right here. We've also got Spanish on the other side. And all this is, this is just an engagement card we can hand out to folks that we see. It's pretty uh, non-invasive. Let them see the difference and take on um, one of the things we're going to be looking at doing is uh, also for our below the House District, below the House District uh, <coughs> seats, we can apply for CRC funding, Judge and uh, County Commissioner Hale. I think they helped you out last year. So one of the things that they're doing is they're up there, um, we'll ask you to apply for CRC funds as a Canada Resource Committee, and they'll approve certain funding for a lot of our candidates. I'm not sure how much did you get last year. Thanks. Um, they actually ended up sending a couple of checks, so okay. I think it was around, uh, ended up like $2,500. So $2,500 for, uh, for uh, Commissioner Hale. All right. Thank so, you, young man. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. Okay. More things we have a will of fortune, okay? Now we want to hear about the Trump environment. Yeah. Neil? Quick announcement. Um, to get on a ballot, you have a choice. You either pay money in filing fee or you do a petition. If you run for president, you're dealing with 50 states and over 3,000 counties. Money adds up pretty fast. So we have a petition on the elephant desk over there for Donald Trump. Please sign it sometime tonight and all that. We need about 600 signatures to get Donald Trump on the Collin County ballot. We need a deadline for it for us in September. Petition's right there. Please sign it. If you don't have your voter ID, we'll look it up for you. Thank you. Yeah, now that's very important. So everybody, please try to remember and sign. Daryl, uh, Wendell, do you have it? Try to look at it. Okay. I'm All right. Work. Well, now, let's move on. Thank you, uh, Neil, very much. All right. Yeah. But, Wendell, do you have it? The, form, the petition for yeah, Trump? Right mm -hmm. Okay. You help everybody sign it. All right, um, Commissioner Dale, uh, come up, uh, Daryl. This is a unique program that has been implemented to help young men 
get uh, involved. It's a tutoring yeah. program, educational program. You want to talk about? It? Yes. Yeah. So I, I'm in another hat that I wear. I'm the treasurer for Colin Strong, and over the past six months, we conducted about. 25 classes on Friday night for a couple hours a piece, and it was on a variety of subjects from sign design and placement to walk walking to social media, you know, how to set that up, um, just a variety of different subjects. And, you know, we're, we're helping out kids you know, across the board. Uh, we really feel like coming up as well in the next May cycle. It's going to be a, uh, a real fight for the Collin College trustees and also for the city of Allen because Allen's got term limits uh, that are going to take out you know, five individuals. So the Democrats are going to come hard for them as well. So if you want to get, so if you know candidates that want to get involved, you are a candidate that wants to learn about a specific subject, uh, just email me and let me know and. You know, we'll get you on the mailing list. That way, you know, we can let you know on every Friday night as we have subjects come up uh, what it is it's we're training Colin on. Colin Strong. Colin Strong. Dot org? Or what is it? What's yeah. your website? Yeah, ColinStrong.org. All right. Yeah. And Ellen Skinner and yeah. you got together and put this together. Yeah, yeah so and we have an educational tutoring service. Yeah. <laughs> we have Brian Newman's our president. He was Angela Paxson's campaign manager. Um, myself, I ran it. Decent campaign. It was it was successful. I got elected. Um, you know, and then you have Ellen. Um, you know, so she's she's the other half of the uh, Sheriff Skinner team. So she's got an unofficial campaign manager. And then uh, we have Darren Myers, who's a uh, yeah, he's our uh, resident psychologist, psychiatrist, be able to. He, he psychoanalyzes the Democrat opponents for us. All right, but now this is on a fee basis when they yeah. go in register. Yeah. Okay. So it's an educational tutoring service. Yeah, we, we do it we do it basically in groups blocks. So if you wanted to do like six classes, it's like four fifty. Three classes, we do it for two fifty. If you just want to do it all a cart one at a time, we do a hundred dollars a session. We just put the money back in to paying for rooms, materials and supporting Republican candidates and causes. Say more, this be something uh, that you could look at as a young man look at, okay? As a candidate. <laughs> Just and got elected to Collie Collins. Jay, this could be very valuable. And we we did this for the city of Plano. You know, we had um, you know, eight different candidates that came from the Plano races. There were six of them that we had you know, multiple times, and you know, I think we help them out. You know, get them kick started. Ultimately, it's up to the campaigns to go out and win. But we were able to help them out on multiple different fronts, and hey, it turned out well. You know, so. Yeah, I've, I've worked with these guys. I've seen their classes. They're phenomenal. They're great. They're very active. Very committed to what they're doing. They'll be there whether you show up or not. They, they're there. You see them, and where they have one person, where they have ten people. Very, very committed, yeah, very knowledgeable. You know, you can tell in Plano where one person alone can make a difference. So, I mean, you know, getting Shelby elected alongside uh, Lily, you know, made all the difference in the world for Plano. So, if we can just make the difference for one, you know, that's a success for us. Okay, thanks. Well, and that's the thing, we, we, we helped uh, we helped them get set up in Plano together as a slate on Campaign Sidekick, just a walking tool, got them all going. They ended up knocking on 75,000 doors, just an amazing amount. They knocked on a lot of doors like twice. So, Eric, you know, you can go ahead and turn it off. Okay. Fine. Because I thought you'd done that far.